Right, welcome back. Um, before we start, a uh, housekeeping question. Um, dinner will be ready as soon as we finished. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you, you've got a choice. Do so you want it at 6 o'clock or 6.30? Oh, yeah. And I'll come to the pick up at 5. Will you be back for dinner? Right. Right. Okay. Changing of the guards. Um. So what are we saying? Six o'clock. Six thirty. Six to six thirty. Six. <laughs> Soul. So. Six o'clock. Done. <laughs> right. Okay, Seri seriously. Is it lasagna? <laughs> this is going, this is your legacy. Deputy Mayor, this is your legacy. You'll be remembered for that. <laughs> Right, I'm um, serious. Seriously. Um, are we actually having lasagna? Oh, no. Um, six o'clock dinner. Now, let's carry on. Okay. Okay, welcome back. Um, so, this slide is just summarising the major projects. Um, so, these were the projects that were already part of the um, work program um, but it's through the consultation document we made we took the opportunity to describe them a bit more and provide more information to people so there were no specific questions other than if people had general um, comments so that was sent out in the pack that you originally got so for the purposes of today we're just um, providing the, the overall list <coughs> and that, um, that there weren't any specific questions the feedback has been noted and there's no decisions required. Yeah, so can, can I ask some questions? Uh, number one, the gateway, is there money provided in this year in the coming long-term plan budget for the gateway? Is there money provided? Yes. Yes, there is. Okay. The second one, indoor, indoor sports centre, the indoor sports centre, um, is there any money provided in the long-term plan for that? And if not, could we look at a feasibility study for that? So, so through you, Mr. Chair, one of the sections um, that we'll get to in about an hour and a half, or two hours, is just um, councillors uh, to put forward additional proposals. So we are we are aware of the fact that you may want to throw um, you know other things into the mix, but um, no, the answer is no. There is no provision in the budget for a feasibility study for the indoor sports centre. Um, if you recall, when we went through the community board submission. We went through line by line and actually um, the public toilets in McLean Park were brought forward. Um, we spent quite a lot of time on that submission and that was deemed to be um, you know, pretty equitable and fair for um, for the Paraparaumu community, noting that it's not just the Paraparaumu but it was it was uh, it was considered by the table. Um, it was put up on the screen and the decision was not to put that in the budget. So, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, just continuing. Changes to the rating system <clears throat> is our next section. So the question that we um, consulted on is, do you have any views on the proposed changes to the, to the rating system? And um, a number of themes did arise. So um, in terms of supportive themes, uh, there was 79 positive responses to that. Uh, most of that was sitting in just general support for the changes to the proposed rating system. But um, 173 responses weren't so supportive. They sort of did oppose the rating system. And as, as you can see, um, and, and this, is what, this is what we see, I think it's just um, a general, um, <laughs> general response to um, a question about rates is just no, no to rates increases. So actually quite a few responses actually didn't relate to the, the proposed changes that we were making to the rating system. As you know, um, 
what we what we included in the consultation document is that um, we review the rating system every three years to make sure it's fair and equitable. Um, the changes that we were proposing was mainly to a rating rate that was previously land value that was being proposed to change to capital value. In light of what we already know, we know that Autoki's land value increased by 80% on average, and actually that that change was was actually done <coughs> to the benefit of our ratepayers to, um, to 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 help relieve our residential ratepayers, and also we proposed to um, keep it fair and equitable, and, and and put more of the economic development budget onto the commercial sector, as it was deemed that they actually directly benefited from some of that increase in the budget. So. The responses that we got were actually not the opposition responses. We're not actually uh, opposing the proposed changes to the rating system, but in fact, we're more actually just outright opposing rates increases, which we've seen, which we've seen before. But nevertheless, um, it is rich data, and we did um, we did really take on board that there were some comments that it's difficult to understand, and we know that, and we do try and simplify that every time we do the rating system. We do have a complicated rating system: land value, capital value fixed charges, variable charges, differentials, it's not easy. Um, and we do, we do as much as possible try to simplify it. And in terms of increasing tra transparency, there's, there's always, always room for improvement. Um, I think that our individual letters to ratepayers are uh, being very transparent on what their property rates, what the proposed rates increases were going to be on their properties, outlining why, um, really do take the feedback that a lot of that was misunderstood, but we tried. You know, we actually made sure that every single, we didn't just direct everyone to the online rates uh, calculator, but we actually sent letters out. So um, we absolutely do, do, do take on board what they say. And in terms of our recommendation, at the end of the day, the recommended changes to the rating system that we propose to you is to help relieve the rates increases to the, to the residential sector. Um, and to make it a, a, a fairer, more equitable rating system. So, in terms of our staff feedback for your discussion and debate, our recommendation is, of course, we, we absolutely note the feedback, um, mainly regards rates increases. <coughs> so the feedback was mainly regards just uh, opposing rates increases as opposed to the proposed changes to the rating system, and we recommend that we proceed uh, with the proposed changes to the rating system on the basis that it does actually help relieve the increases that are that are hitting the residential sector. Right. Can we take questions first before we go on to making our views known on the recommendation? Chris, Councillor Randall. Yeah. Um, thank you, uh, Mark. I mean, yeah. This is just ge just general interest. Um, there were two types of rates that were included in the last long-term plan. I think a community charge or some charge of some sort, and the other one was the for res, um, commercial. Now I understand to, for simplicity's sake they have been taken out. I could be wrong, but can you do you mind just clarifying that? Thank you. Yeah, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, look, certainly, certainly, Councillor. So we we have a commercial rate, and that was introduced uh, at the start of the last uh, LTP. Um, that was the first time it came in. It was a commercial rate, and we're proposing to increase that commercial rate. Um, and then we have a community rate. So each of the wards uh, has a community rate, which is a capital value-based rate, um, which funds the community boards, the grants that the community boards distrib uh, distribute. So um, in terms of the current rating system for the current year, the only thing we've actually proposed is to actually is to, is to eliminate one rate. So we've currently got two rates that pertain to rating charges. One's by way of capital value, one's by way of land value, and we're saying eliminate the land value one. Actually, wrap them into one because it's confusing to the it's confusing to the public. And and I'd be happy to take you through the rating system, councillor. Any other questions, mm -hmm. councillor Halliday? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Look, uh, just um, more um, asking for thoughts. Uh, I mentioned um, at the beginning um, we've got the um, um, local government review coming up. You know, we talk about uh, reviewing rates in our three-year periods. But would it be a fair comment to say that through that review we're hoping to get uh, the ability to take a serious look at our rating system as such and how it works. <laughs> Oh goodness, is that the time? Um, 
Um, it would be fair to say we would like to see that in there. Um, they are currently doing a piece of work which they're due to deliver in September, which essentially scopes out the review and says these are the things we're going to look at. And um, yes, I would absolutely, you know, you're absolutely right in reflecting what you hear from me all the time. The real, the real issue is funding. Um, that has caused everybody's problems, um, and it, you know, it gets worse and worse as the world gets more complicated. Unfunded mandates, assets are getting, you know, harder to to maintain standards that they've ex expected for things like fresh water, um, going up and up. Absolutely, if there was a, a, a funding stream that recognised people's ability to pay and it didn't result in our annual um, sort of um, Oliver Twist, please sir, can I have some more? No, you can't. Well, I'm going to have it anyway. Um, yeah, anything that would address that would be quite high on my list of ideal topics to cover. Trevor. Uh, and Alison and her spiel talked about um, braiding for benefit on the seawall. Uh, I haven't heard anyone talk about, talk about that. And some some people they get protect, special protection because of uh, council um, assets behind the wall. Keep exit. But they also benefit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we didn't go there um, in terms of this proposal. Uh, we did look at it actually three years ago about um, whether we would look at a targeted rate for Paikakariki residents. Um, for some or all of the seawall cost, and um, it's pretty horrendous. And our principles across this district for since long before I started here have been much more about aggregation of costs and spreading it, because the benefits will get very lumpy otherwise. You know, and, and, and the timing of rates increases and potentially lesser increases or even decreases depending on an area. So I know that, you know, um, you, in a similar vein, you've heard in particular Waikanae Beach residents talk about proportionality. And really what they're saying is, can you treat me as my own little area? I only want to pay for what I get. That is not the principle we've run this organisation by for uh, many, many years. It has been much more about aggregation. Um, long way of saying, so we didn't put it in front of this table as a possible option when we looked at the Paikakariki seawall because we felt we had addressed it um, three years ago and, and we were satisfied that, that the, the disbenefits to the locals would outweigh the fact that, that this overall as an infrastructure protection device as much as anything benefits the district in a, in a bigger way, more substantial way. We need to have the other underlying conversations. Out of that might fall some policy work um, and maybe a, a council one day will say revisit that but at the moment we didn't suggest it, and um, to be fair, nor did you at the time. Do you think, Mr. Chief Executive, that the Takutai Kapiti program or consultation process may pop up that question? Absolutely, yes. And, and it'll be one of the ins into revisiting that conversation, I think, yes. Anybody else? No questions. So are we happy with that recommendation? Cool. That's the thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so next section is around fees and charges, um, acknowledging that the regulatory fees were adopted this morning. Um, so it's just the remainder, um, and particularly around the ones that are outside of the LGCI um, increase. So swimming pool. Um, fees and um, the discussion around older persons, persons housing, um, but that's covered on the next slide. So um, this one particularly is in reference to um, the swimming pool fee increases. Um, so noting that there was some level of general support, um, but opposition towards swimming pool fees um, and also have particularly noted um, the swimming pool fee for spectators. Um, so the swimming pool fees, the, there were two new fees proposed, so introducing a new um, $1 per spectator, um, and that was um, estimated at providing a further $25,000 of revenue, or 0.04%. So these 
these amounts are in the budgets now, so the, num the rates number that we have is including um, this increased revenue for swimming pools. Um, and also a new fee of $1 per swimmer attending the club or group activities that hire lanes, um, and that has resulted in a 0 0.03 rates decrease, but increase if these charges don't go ahead. Um, so the, the staff recommendation for that is to, um, to proceed, um, noting that many pools do have um, spectator fees, and um, at the moment the club lane hire is well, it will be $8.50 um, an hour, regardless of the number of swimmers. But obviously um, up for discussion. And then secondly in this section was the um, housing for older people. So the proposal to increase rentals to cover 80% of council costs. Um, and the um, recommendation there is around continuing the review of rental fees for report back to council um, and also to broaden the range of the revenue and finance policy to accommodate any changes of the funding split, so in line with ways that we've treated others. Yes, <coughs> through you Mr Mayor. Look, thank you Alison, I might just expand on that a little bit. So, um, uh, look, we obviously, right now, um, the current the current revenue and financing policy for um, for this has a has an 80/20 private public funding split, and um, for this financial year we're achieving 57% of that. So we're recovering recovering 57% of our fees through rentals. Um, when we when we brought this to the table uh, many months ago, um, you did instruct us to uh, make sure that we were recovering 80% of the costs. So um, work has been underway. Um, to actually determine what that actually means for our for our renters, uh, discussions have been had. So I guess what we're saying is, um, look, there's still a little bit of work to be done. Um, we've adopted a, um, we, we're proposing at the moment. We've we've overhauled, as you know, we've overhauled the revenue and financing policy as part of the draft long-term plan. And um, on, on the instructions that we've received from yourselves to date, we've got it's the it's the only part of our revenue and financing policy that has a definitive. Uh, public-private funding split. It's still sitting at um, 20, 80, 20, 20 public, 80 private. And we've gone to we've gone to um, lots of effort to make sure that we introduce ranges um, so that we can actually be compliant with our revenue and financing policy. So um, legal advice is, um, if you're not compliant with your revenue and financing policy, it's it's actually it's okay. You know, it's not it's not standard practice. It's not it's not really good. But there's no um, there's no there's no penalties. There's no punishment. And, and and our desire is that when we set our fees and charges, that we actually are compliant with our revenue and financing policy. So, I guess it's a it's a it's a change request um, that we'd like to propose today. So um, yes, we've heard you that you'd like us to recover 80% of the costs through through the rentals. Um, we aren't achieving that at the moment. Um, if we lower it, it's a it's a it's a rates increase effectively. Um, but the, the the I guess the request today is is um, could we please make a change to our revenue and financing policy and like everything else, put a little range, you know, 55 to 80%. Obviously. We want to be recovering the 80% if we can, if it's affordable uh, for for our for our renters. There is still work that's being underdone or, or undertaken to see what exactly how it impacts on 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 our renters. Um, and the proposal will be to once once we've once we finish that review, we'll we'll bring it back for discussion. We'll have a briefing with yourself so we can outline exactly what those impacts are. But it's it's really I guess it's our first change from the. From the revenue and financing policy that we've consulted on, we'd like to change that range. Uh, we have consulted on 80%. Um, we would like to finish that review before 24th of June. Um, if if we don't, and you still want 80% of cost recovered through fees and charges, when you set the long-term plan and you set the fees and charges, the fees and charges will reflect a, a rental that recovers 80% of those costs. And then subsequently to that, um, you can't implement those new rentals um, within a period of 60 days. So there's a time limit before you can put the new rentals in place. If we uh, finish that review, present it to you, and you actually change your mind, and you actually want to change what those fees are, then what we'd need to do is we need to come back to Council and we need to just ask you to um, adopt uh, revised fees and charges for that. So 
So I guess it's um, sorry, it's quite a lot lot there. But what I'm what I'm asking is, could we please make a change to the revenue and financing policy to reflect a greater range in what we what the private funding split could be from from 55 to 80 percent? And um, please bear with us. We're working through the numbers, and we will we will report back what what that how what the impacts will be on on our renters. So look. Thanks, um, Your Worship. So, uh, so Mark, just on the housing one, um, I, like other elected members, was supportive of that move. Um, the submissions that came through painted a different picture, and I'm not sure that's an accurate picture, um, suggesting increases of up to 50% in, in tenants' costs. So, in uh, what I'm seeing today in the staff recommendation, it's a departure from what we had in the consultation document. So, essentially, you've taken on board the feedback uh, acknowledge that there's more work needed to be done there to consider it and that we'll have a decision at a later date. Is essentially what you're saying? Because if that's the case then I'm comfortable with that. I, I was uncomfortable with making a decision, not taking for for granted that the submissions were accurate, but actually that there wasn't sufficient information to know how accurate or inaccurate they were and how much of a um, an impost these changes would be putting on the residents. It's appeared, it appears to be more than what we thought it would be. Um, and so that further information would help us make a more educated decision. So if that's what you're suggesting there, then I'm comfortable with that, that you bring it back. I think what I understand correctly is in order to do that, though, you, you do need to broaden the, um, the revenue and finance policy to enable that. Yes, through, through you, Mr Mayor. Absolutely, Councillor, that's exactly what I'm saying. Um, my suggestion to broaden the range of the revenue and financing policy is so that we don't have to potentially bring back to the table an amendment to the revenue and financing policy. It, allow, it gives us a range with, within which to operate. We currently are doing 57%. You may decide around the table, actually, that's what you wanted to stay at, in which case there's a $233,000 uplift to our, to our rates revenue requirement. But it gives us that range so that... Um, uh, we may not change anything, we may just change the fees and charges schedule, but we, uh, by doing the range, we don't have to come back and change the revenue and financing policy as well. All right, just one last thing. Um, I may be wrong in this, but from what I'm led to believe, only two or three of the tenants turned up to the workshop or whatever, you, you know, the session that council staff held to discuss this. So my concern is that with all good intentions, your team do some really great work in the background, but in the absence of engaging with the actual tenants and understanding their circumstances, that's kind of a missing piece of the puzzle. I was under the impression that um, staff had gone door knocking. Waiting for, oh, here we go. Um, through you, Mr Mayor, we uh, have conducted uh, two public sessions for tenants, um, which were information sessions on um, the current program, how it's operated, the po current policies, and also um, through the long-term plan consultation of, of recovery of 80%, um, which is um, proposed, what that would mean in terms of um, impact to them and how we would look to try and mitigate the costs to tenants directly through activating other grants and so on through central government such as the accommodation supplement. Um, there was also within that um, proposals to potentially level out the amount of rents that single occupancy and double occupancy tenants pay because there's huge inequity. Um, it's just purely through when tenants join the programme. Um, those that have been there for many, many years are on much lower rents than other tenancies, and so there is um, great variance. Also, um, what's considered a, a double single and a double occupancy is um, questionable at times because of the, the size difference is negligible between the two. So, um, so that proposal in terms of what that meant for tenants. So we were having those sessions to cover off what was out there for LTP consultation to encourage their feedback. Um, and that they submit on it because sometimes, particularly within this group, um, they may feel they're making a submission by talking to councillors, but that isn't actually the process. They need to make formal submissions through the process, and that's what we were encouraging on that basis. So, so in terms of numbers, Sasha, that, are, that attended? 
So between we held one in Otaki and we held one uh, at um, Coastlands, and probably combined we probably had about 35 to 40. And um, as I understand it, every tenant has had the information given to, to their address um, a, as part of inviting them to come and do this. Um, and I don't know what follow-up there's been, but every single individual has been um, given the information. Just, just to reiterate, um, this is probably slightly unusual in that normally we'd know exactly what rents we want to um, recommend to you. We just want um, a few more days to work through those implications and make sure we've covered it. And we are confident that things like the accommodation supplement do go to the to the tenants, because it's largely going to be true that the rents for some will have gone up by a lot, but the cost to them won't have, because they, in their pocket, should be getting these supplements back. And that seems to be the point that they haven't shared with us when they've put in their submission. I think they're aware of it. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, through you, Chair, that we've spoken to them at length about the opportunities that's available to them and trying to help them access that, that um, additional funding. So in the follow-up to those, I guess, broader tenancy sessions, we've had one-on-ones, as the um, Chief Executive has mentioned, but also um, any queries that they've had follow-up on that, on how to access accommodation supplements and what it means and, and those sorts of things, we've followed up directly uh, with those individuals. But we were also very clear that they were aware that this was under LTP consultation because I, I suggest probably many weren't quite sure um, and the formal way to get make sure their voices were heard in that regard. You done, James? Yes, thank you. Um, still keeping on the same topic, Councillor McCann. Thank you. I, unlike uh, Councillor Coates, opposed this motion and I do remember it was very, very close and uh, Councillor Buswell's hand was helped up, if I remember, because uh, I was watching. Um, so it really wasn't uh, a, a very clear-cut clear, clear cut decision, but I'm very heartened that we have slowed the process down to help understand, help uh, the tenants understand what their rights are and what they are able to access, because that was a key reason for opposing uh, the, the rise, because we didn't have that information. So I'm very comfortable with what you've proposed with that range and trying to ensure that we have the information that we can make the decision on. I would just like to add um, through the mayor, that once we have that information and a decision, I don't. I would like to hope that the council will still hold the hand of those tenants going through the process because they are some of our most vulnerable people in our community. Um, what was I going to say? You support it. No, um, <laughs> no. I was going to say, um, how does this? Does this? affect the tenancies that we currently have. And I remember some discussion, I can't remember whether it was this recent discussion or in the previous um, plan, that um, it was only to be instigated on new tenancies as opposed to current tenancies. Yeah, so five, six years ago, the mm. instruction was only do it when there's a new tenant coming in, only yeah. put the rent up, which is what caused the big rent variations. Mm. Um, and so what uh, what the proposal is now is everybody's got to be made e equitable in terms of that's a fair rent for that, that tenancy. So it is quite a big change for some. Yeah, OK, thank you. Mm. I do remember um, this conversation. We, we decided to go out and consult at 80% so that we could then make a decision within the full range of 55 to 80%. So, yes. Um, and I'm very pleased with the position that we're at. Oh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to clarify that you have visited every um, resident that has in a pension house because I live, the pension houses are in Arnold Grove and Oakley Court at Paraparaumu Umu Beach, and the meeting was held at Coastlands. And I do know that some of our elderly residents have mental and physical challenges and many do not drive and need a taxi to go out so I just wondered if maybe that was because of the low uptake because people actually couldn't afford a taxi or, or whatever but so I was just checking to see that all residents to clarify that they were all, all visited. Through you Chair, the, um, the residents have all received a letter on the um, proposal um, and uh, in terms of the attendance at the meetings, we were aware that there might be difficulty for some of the tenants. So we took a role as to who had attended the events that we put on. 
and um, we asked the tenants that attended to let their neighbours know and that we would be contacting each of those tenants that didn't attend a meeting um, and go through the information with them and that's what was done. Because we do have a responsibility for our community's well-being now. I think we all is said and Councillor McCann's point is well taken on that side. Um, Councillor uh, thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I just wanted to endorse Councillor McCann's comments. Thank you very much. Uh, but I did want to know whether the, um, it's applicable for us to have, well, I know I'd like to um, get an understanding of what costs are involved uh, uh, the, in regards to this, I guess, as a project um, income versus expense or something along that sort of line. Um, <coughs> I meant the, the general run of um, our uh, elderly housing as such, if that's um, I can answer that if you like. Um, through you, Mr Chair, the, um, the costs, so defining the costs for homes for older people is, consists of um, water rates and insurance, um, the overheads of uh, two full-time employees, um, and uh, one is permanent, one is fixed term, and there's um, one 20-hour Per, per month uh, tenancy liaison officer who actually is on the ground speaking to tenants as things arise or if they need support in any way. Um, property and grounds maintenance, uh, depreciation and interest and green waste disposal. So um, that is the bucket of costs that go into um, determining what is the full cost of the program. And uh, the costs exclude, i.e. the tenant pays, phone, power, internet, television and rubbish that helps. So broadly speaking, it's about a million bucks a year. And at the moment we're recovering just under 600,000. Yeah, well, the reason I ask was because I generally so, did come in here with a breakdown, um, yeah, regardless of right or wrong. Which was really interesting. But, um, and, well, there's more than likely other people in that situation that are uh, more than likely doing a very similar sort of thing. So having a clear understanding of those expenses does allow us the opportunity to explain this to people if needed to be in a more in-depth way. Yeah, so, so the ratepayers are currently um, paying about $400,000 towards those 118 tenants. Councillor Compton. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to make the observation that I remember, similar to Rob remembering how our, our hand was helped up, I'd suggested sort of finding a middle ground between the two ranges we're looking at, and now we have a range to consider that. So, I mean, yeah, I think <laughs> what's being proposed in terms of looking at that, that range is reasonable, so just wanted to... Um, Chip in with my support for that then. So no other questions on that, um, and I take it there's general agreement with what you've recommended on that one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Trevor, have you got a question? Yeah, just uh, we've been involved a little bit with this, and what I, my question is: um, what assistance is available? What what did Wynn say to? Are they all able to access the the benefit, the supplement, when it, when if they need it? Uh, through through you, Chair. In terms of discussing the individual circumstances, we we don't have any entitlement to talk about uh, due due to privacy um, with wins. However, we did research on the accommodation supplement and exactly what our tenants can access based on the rents that they would be paying if we were to undertake a model um, which was to recover 80% of costs and the accommodation supplement would be triggered and, ki and kick in uh, to the approximate value of 70 cents in the dollar um, over a particular rental threshold. So the added costs of the rents through an 80% cost recovery model uh, 70 cents in the dollar would be recovered um, through an accommodation supplement. 30 cents in the dollar would be an actual rental increase to the tenant themselves. Okay, um, I think staff can take the, the, the take off for your interim step that you're taking and you'll come back to us. Thank you. The next one is any questions on the swimming pool? I think you want through you, Mr. Chair. Is that right? Sorry, I was, uh, I was jumping into the pool a little bit too quickly. Um, 
you had asked for a steer, and I would like to suggest that I have read the submissions. I don't remember seeing a single one thinking this was a good idea. Um, and I think it sends a really poor signal to the community and to parents who, who come along to, their, um, to watch their kids swim or learn to swim. Um, so I'm opposed to the staff recommendation, and I think we should swallow it up if there's such a small amount that can lead to significantly lower numbers of participation. Um, yeah, um, similar views. I've read all the submissions, and frankly, for some families, the ability to send a child to the pool and uh, for swimming lessons and pay for it might be their biggest achievement for their kids that whole year, and to have to say, sorry, you can't go, um, is, it happens too often. So I am opposed to this recommendation. I am just going to dive in behind uh, Councillors McCann and uh, Elliot on that one. Well, I was I was going to be happy being a spectator on this one, but I'm going to dive in as well. <laughs> I'm going to jump in. <laughs> so I I just remember through the submissions that it may seem like a low number, but quite a few of the submissions were on behalf of groups of quite large groups of families and children. So, and it doesn't add a lot, a significant amount to our revenue. So, I'm supporting not going ahead with the proposed changes. In agreement with what everyone else has already said. I'm just going to make a brief comment. Um, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to mention the word speed, eh, but given that Councillor Compton did. Um, look, I think the interesting thing here, as a councillor, I'd already received feedback prior to the LTP on the existing charges, let alone any increased charges, and that comes from a lower socioeconomic community. So um, although as a council we, we supported this going out, um, the impact um, is different across different areas. And so for that reason, I, as much as I don't want to see a 0.04% uh, increase in, are we talking about both of them or just the... Um, whatever increase, um, I agree with the, um, the sentiments of the other councillors around the table. Thank you, Mr Chair. So there's two parts to this. One is um, the um, lane charges for swimmers. And so we heard from the Otaki um, Surf Life Saving Club and I've also heard from the Waikanae um, Swimming Club. And I suppose both these groups use the pool for different reasons. One is to train to save people. The other one is to learn to swim, to not to be saved. And so to me, it, um, it makes a lot of sense to be actually um, helping our communities to, um, to be a safer place. Um, I, and when it comes, to, so, so I'm opposed to the lane um, charge being put in place, or the, you know, the, the $1 per, lane charge user for these groups. Um, so when it comes to the spectators, I'm actually um, um, in, slot, in more agreement to including this because there is a charge when spectators, um, particularly over the summer holidays, do use the pugs because they are using the facilities um, at no charge and there is a cost to ratepayers to that in the opposite way. Thank you. Yeah, um, I actually support the council's recommendations. Um, number one, otherwise, uh, and I agree with what Councillor Pravanov just, has just said, otherwise you get um, the um, community card holders, um, aquatic classes and older people um, fees increased, as they had done in previous years. So I thought, I thought this um, year's proposed charges was quite reasonable across the broad section of the community. Um, I won't agree with uh, Councillor Randall on this one. I will synchronise my views with the rest of the councillors with regards to um, <laughs> the view on that. Um, but uh, just to take on board what was said with regards to... Um, I am a little bit concerned about Waikanae Pool um, with regards to spectators in that area. I'm not too sure what the charging is around that. Um, in, in regards to people just going in and having picnics and that sort of scenario where, there, um, where there's a charge that covers that uh, as such, but I'm, I'm afraid I don't know 
Great. Okay, that's cool. But uh, no, no, I'm, 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 I'm synchronised with the others. Um, thank you. Just one point of clarification. Um, so, any parents going with children to learn to swim, or swim club, or those group activities, or supervising an under eight, don't pay a spectator fee for the reasons that have been brought forward. So, if you're not supervising or related to learn to swim, then you would pay the spectator rate. Um, I'm happy to go with the um, with the councillors to, to drop this proposal. I don't see us ever charging people going to the hockey turf to watch their children play hockey, whether they're under eights or over eights. Um, and I, I don't see the need here. Um, you know, people on the rugby field, they still use our facilities, they still go to the toilet and things like that. So um, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to waiver it. Right, it looks like um, this is not going to float. Look, this is not, the recommendation is not going to float, eh? So that's right. <laughs> Enough already. So. Okay, so the next section um, was around levels of service. So um, again, it was a general open-ended um, question. We made, first off made the point in the consultation document that um, levels of service in general are actually increasing because of what we're proposing around investing for resilience and growth and all those other things. Um, the one reduced proposed levels of service was... Um, do I change the slide? was around the um, proposal for closing the Waikanae Recycling and Green Waste um, site. So this slide is just showing the themes of responses that we um, received through that. So there was some support shown, um, but more opposition shown. Um, so either generally or specific things such as people thought it was bad for the environment from people having to drive further, um, they used the facility so they didn't want to see it closed, um, wanted to see recycling to, to continue. Um, some people thought that it could lead to illegal dumping or green waste um, in general. Um, and then so uh, some ideas around needing to have more um, information or consultation required. Um, so... Question. So I do understand why staff wanted to consolidate to two sites uh, uh, and concentrate on development of Otahanga uh, landfill site um, for waste recovery. And um, however, I don't, um, I don't believe that this is a positive move towards encouraging people to to reduce waste and recycle. At all, I, I felt for the demographic in Waikanae. I certainly read all the submissions, um, and and I think most of all, I think small communities do recycling really well, really far better than the bigger, like the the Pada Pada Umu Raumati, don't do it half as well as little uh, Otaki, little Paikakariki, and, and and little and and it's because community creates really good vibe for this. Um, I would like to be keeping this Waikanae one um, open, this facility completely open, and of course knowing that there are negotiations still underway with the um, composter, um, the contractor, um, I think it's really important that that, that gets um, sorted out and discussed and agreed to first as well. Can I just ask a question um, around I mean, there's, there's obviously a proposal there to continue the green waste service if there was a contract that was stru struck with the existing operator, which would see some increased revenue come in from that lease agreement. Is there the ability to talk with the existing operators around servicing uh, those areas that don't currently receive council services, if there, there's enough um, houses within the street? So, for example, some of those more rural properties? Because that was one of the issues that was raised through the submissions, is that there's actually no service for some of those to have access to.
Uh, so yes, the current operators do actually um, look to extend services if people ask them for those services. So um, it really is, I guess, a financial consideration based on the number of requests relative to the cost of taking a truck further down a rural road to maybe pick up one or two um, recyclable containers as opposed to uh, uh, where they might end their route. So yeah, I, they, and I'm aware they have extended the service uh, over the last couple of years into some of those areas that uh, have been previously outside of the urban zone for collections. But I, I don't expect it would be significant if, you know, I wouldn't expect that they would be offering all of those people that currently don't have collections in the rural areas that were talked about um, would be financially viable, but they they have been providing additional services in some areas. So the follow-up question is, if they're, the will of the council today is to continue with that service, what happens with the discussions around a lease agreement with the company that's existing there? Sorry, Councillor, so um, I'm not quite sure. So, the Council suggests that the status quo is that there's a discussion with yes. that operator around the lease will the client go away. So I expect if we, if the decision is to status quo, which would continue for recycling drop-off and green waste, then um, there would be t potentially the option to look for some revenue for the green waste, but I expect that would be offset through the additional cost associated with managing the recyclables. So if that was a, uh, a recommendation, then we'd need to put back in the full amount that um, we've suggested that, that has been removed. So I think it's $123,000 would need to go back in to the budget, and that is, I think, 0 0.02. Three, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I would like to uh, add this service back in. I just think it sends the wrong message to our community at a time when we are trying to say that we are um, environmentally friendly and trying to encourage other people uh, to act in that way. So I think the small saving is not worth um, the negative message that we're sending. And further to that, not only is it a barrier to participation from some of our rural, more rural uh, members, but I think there needs to be a longer piece of work to work out how they can be included and how we can negotiate with all of those people who are picking up our waste or another piece of work to look at how we can bring it in-house. My thoughts. I 100% agree with Councillor McCann and Councillor Elliott. I think um, we saw from the impassioned speakers on this topic that um, it's not something that the Waikanae community wants to lose, but I think it's not something that the district um, can afford to lose at the point in time where we're trying to promote resilience, we're trying to promote living locally, um, and all of those things, and people reducing their impact, and also people taking responsibility of their own footprint. Um, and their own impact, and people are really wanting to do that. So I think, as Councillor McCann has said, um, in making any changes to the status quo, in fact, I think we should be um, providing more education and supporting people to actually um, better recycle and giving them the tools and education to do that. Um, so yeah, I'm fully in support of what Councillor McCann has said and Councillor Elliott, um, in that I think, yeah, the current kind of recommendation on the table, um, we need to put the money back in, is my view. Thank you, Mr Chair. So I've heard from many Waikanae residents um, that they would like to to, um, to see this facility continue for the very reasons that um, the previous councillors have said, and I agree with what the councillors, so um, yes, I agree that the money should, should go back in. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, I hear what everyone's saying, I'm afraid I disagree. 
Um, I will support the, um, the proposal. I hear what everyone's saying. Um, I'm aware that we've had substantial uh, cost in increases with regard to transporting. And I think we need to be perhaps be looking at different options with regard to this. We're in an uh, evolving environment in our waste and minimisation. Um, yes, you do need to take responsibility. Um, but um, that, as a system, doesn't seem to be working that well. We're getting a lot of rubbish dumped there as well, uh, according to um, reporting back. So um, I do take on board uh, with caveats that we do need to be looking at um, options with regards to recycling. Um, and I'm, a, I'm an adamant supporter of that and of uh, taking responsibility for your own footprint. But um, I think there's other things that we can be looking at with regards to achieving that. Yeah, I just wanted to add my voice in support of Councillors Elliot, McCann, uh, Pavanov and Hampered around uh, retaining this and also uh, what Ma Councillor McCann said at the very end of his comments around that we need to, I think, signal a bigger piece of work about investigating bringing uh, rubbish recycling and green waste back in house similar to what Hutt City Council has, well, is just about to do on the 1st of July. I'm in two minds about this at the moment. I just looked at Google Maps and it's a seven minute drive to get from one place to the other right now, which is quite a busy time of day. Uh, and another seven minutes back, I guess. But yeah, and, and if you look at it kind of in terms of the impact on people, most of the people that use it have access to curbside recycling. There's a small handful of people who come from rural communities who are already in their cars so presumably they can carry on five minutes down the road probably by the time they go from State Highway 1 to another facility. So I don't think that it's actually going to have a major impact on waste in Carpety to close this facility. But having said that, there are a number of users who are used to using it. This has happened quite suddenly and we haven't sorted out quite what happens with curbside recycling in those rural areas. So I think where I've landed is I'd like to see this come through the next annual plan so that we've got a bit more time to socialise it with the local community and make and, and work out the, exactly what the impact's going to be. That's where I've got to, but yeah, only just. Yeah, I'd just like to agree with Councillor Compton and others. Um, that's my view, the same as Councillor Compton and... Councillor Hanford and Councillor McCann. I never actually said I opposed it. <laughs> I haven't made any comment because I've got a conflict of interest with this topic. Not sure that I should make this comment, but I just want to put. On, I just want. To, you'll see. You'll decide. I just want to put on the record that I totally understand what everyone said. We've been through this debate, as some councillors know, regularly. Um, we will keep saying it is inefficient to do this. Um, this is an incredible subsidy per user compared to anything we do. When you consider, as Councillor Holborough said, how many people actually need it because they can't get their recycling collected. So um, it's absolutely your choice. I just want you to recognise that I don't think we subsidise anything to the tune of, I don't know, probably well over $1,000 per person to, to provide this service. He's going to double down on me. Sean. I, just the um, suggestion about bringing this back as part of the annual plan process, the... I guess the provision of a long-term lease for the operation of the green waste on that site would be, um, I expect, part of that commercial conversation about uh, the viability of that proposal. So if the suggestion is that we wouldn't enter into anything longer than 12 months, then that may have an impact in terms of those discussions, but it's just... Can, can you clarify that? I mean, what um, Council Holborough has suggested is we bring it back. Um, are you saying that's not viable? No, I'm saying uh, a 12 month lease may not be as attractive to the composting New Zealand down there mm. uh, as opposed to a more longer term lease for the operation of that facility. 
I guess the other issue would be, as the Chief Executive has mentioned, we have, we have brought this proposal to this table a number of times with multiple options, so I'm not quite sure what other options we would actually bring back in 12 months' time as part of the annual plan process. So we have an issue over efficiency of our waste minimization, uh, what we, uh, that we do, but we are worried about the message that we are giving to the community that we are closing down a facility. So we are, so, so what is it that we are saying in real terms, we want efficiency of waste minimization or we want to just um, have the nice message that we are green when it costs a lot to do that. Um, waste minimisation does cost a lot, but we have to reduce by a third per person in the next five years or so, uh, and we really are encouraging people to um, reduce waste, and people are reducing waste to the point that they don't even have to have a contract anymore or bin supply. They don't use them. They take a bag every month to the tip, uh, our waste transfer station, and regularly during that month they take all their recycling to the... Um, uh, recycling facilities and, and I think on that reason alone to encourage people to reduce waste is just absolutely integral that we have um, this day in the community. Um, I would hope that um, more than a hundred people uh, use the Waikanae waste facility and I'm pretty sure that more than a hundred people do, 123 even. So my point councillor is um, all the Waikanae beach residents have access to trucks collecting their recycling. Uh, they choose to also go to that station because it's convenient. So I am saying that um, they have a choice. It is the few rural residents who don't have that choice is really what that subsidy relates to. Let, let's cut into the chase. Let's cut into the chase. Can you have a show of hands for those who support the recommendation? Three. Those against? There, you've got the message. Yes. Mr Mayor, yes. I just have a clarification. At what point, um, because when we make decisions there's a certain uh, limit of time before we're allowed to reassess it, what is the limit? What is the time period before we can look at this decision again? Hi, that, that sort of relates to, um, it's, it's generally six months before you can bring back a paper um, on a same issue that you've already said something to. So that's more about if we put something up and you say no and then we come back a month later and have another go at exactly yes. the same thing because we don't have new information, that would that generally you'd say that's not, not, we would say that's not appropriate. So my clarification is because the Deputy Mayor has suggested that it's, it's for this process and then look at it, uh, the next annual plan, that would, regardless of what we say, that possibility exists, doesn't it? Uh, Councillor, it does. Um, uh, based on what I just said, I'd kind of go, uh, only if we had something new to put in front of you. You've heard Mr Mellon say he doesn't think we've got anything new to put in front of you. Um, definition of insanity. Um, try this again. <laughs> Expect a different result. <laughs> so, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, just, uh, just in terms of... Um, Obviously, we consulted on proposed changes to our policies. In terms of the comments and responses we got back, there was there was really there was really nothing to. There's no alarm bells. There was no um, strong indication that we actually needed to recommend a change to our policies. However, um, we've just spoken about changing the range uh, to the revenue and financing policy in terms of the rentals for our um, older persons' housing. So, um, so we would. Uh, from the steer that we got from yourselves, uh, we'd be making that small amendment to the RNF policy, which would be different to what we consulted on, so a small amendment. And then in terms of the other three big ones, in terms of the rates remission, the development contributions policy and the significance engagement, we aren't proposing any changes to that. So we're, um, we're indicating that we would, uh, we would roll them into uh, final policies for your review and approval come the 24th of June. So that, that's our recommendation. Um, uh, time for you to provide us to discuss, debate, and provide us a clear steer, please. Councillor Elliot. Um, just, um, I, I would just like to know what happened to the slide about four slides ago that had a series of 12 boxes up there and different topics in each one. 
Um, I don't know if there are recommendations. Uh, there weren't a rec recommendations for those topics, but there's definitely, I would, wanted to discuss about four of them, and they are all things that everyone, that, that our submitters commented on. So we're going to go back to that slide and finish it, because so only one question got asked by Councillor Randall, and then the slide got switched. Yeah. So um, through you, Mr. Mayor, so, so that I think the slide that you're um, referring to, Councillor, was the major projects. And what we did say is uh, we said that we would do section by section by section and we'd take, we'd take questions as we went. So when we move on to the next, next question, uh, next section, we've, we've moved on. So um, we, we've, been, been, we've been guided by the table and we didn't have any questions, so we've moved on. So, so through you, Mr. B. Councillor, now the intention is not to go back to the slide. What we've got to get you through between now and 8 p.m. plus breaking for dinner is um, a brief financial overview. We've got to run you through all the um, submission requests for additional funding that we've got to take you through. You've made some changes today to the rates increase, so we've got to summarise that. So, um, so you're saying that nine months after staff managing this process, months of managing this process, that we've got. So, Councillor, before you arrived, so, Councillor, the intention of today's workshop will go to 8pm. What we're trying to do is to get you through the slides. If we don't get you through the slides, we will be um, reconvening at the next workshop on the 1st of June. What, what we're trying to do is we recognise that we are rushing you, so we're trying to get you through all the decisions tonight to allow you a couple of days to reflect on those. Come the 1st of June, we'll reiterate what, what decisions we think you've given us, or sorry, what clear steers you've given us to revisit that. that. That's what we're trying to do, and that's what was discussed at the very beginning of, of our session at 1.30. Okay, so we will have the opportunity Can to go back and... Councillor, um, uh, we, keep, we keep kind of, I think we're talking, we keep forgetting that you did miss the introduction. And sorry, I, we, so, so sorry. So some of the stuff that you're addressing, I, I think we answered, uh, we provided input, uh, guidance to councillors. And it does include the fact that the last thing that will happen is there'll be a chance for councillors to raise anything that they think we've overlooked or haven't covered. So, you know, within reason, you're going to have an opportunity then to raise anything that you feel hasn't been adequately debated. So um, it'll be at discretion of the chair, but if there's something you feel we need to loop back to, we can probably do that then. I, I think given that you're not around the table and you missed that, and, and, and the oh, fact is... No, hold on, hold on, hold on. You still have a chance, an opportunity next week when the councillors have a chance to review anything that they've missed. So that's your chance to, to do that. Yeah. So let's just move this along. Um, I just wanted to note broadly uh, in support of what, what's being proposed, but we had discussed um, rates for mission being a very blunt tool and that there was more information that we could gather as to how that could be more supportive and just want that on the record so councillors to remember that we have talked about that. Um, yeah, on a similar vein, there was some feedback, not a huge amount, saying that that fund needed to be increased even further, given the level of increases. But probably more to the point around what Councillor McCann has said, there were several submitters that said that the criteria was too tight, that the income thresholds were too low, and so forth. So I don't know what the solution is to that. I know that the um, intention to raise it um, in terms of the level of rates for emission was to try and help those that were most vulnerable within our community. And then just acknowledge because of that criteria that might not reach all those uh, individuals or families. So I, I support this um, and I'm pleased by the feedback that we got there. Um, last comment and also the anecdotal responses also illustrated people's lack of knowledge or understanding of one that we already do rates for emission, this is not something new, um, and two at the level of rates for emission that we provide. Um, but the key point is around that criteria and the ability to be able to be flexible around that. Right. Uh, Councillor McCann, you still... So, through you, Mr Mayor, with your indulgence, it is really a question for the CE. Um, because the housing programme is just developing and one of those discussions is development contributions, we, the question is, will we still be able to consider that and have that considered by our policy experts 
as part of the housing program, despite what we're talking about now? Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, you know, we've had this conversation a few times through this process. We're setting, we're going, as part of this, we'll be setting DCs um, based on very limited changes. Um, we've acknowledged that that bigger piece of work about how we can try and um, tweak the DCs to, to provide the right incentives and disincentives um, is the piece of work that will come through that program. That's what you're asking, and that's what I'm confirming will be happening. Right. No other question for comments. Um, I think the staff recommendation is acceptable. So you've got something, James? It's um, separate to this discussion. Previously in other long-term plans, and I think Mark just briefly touched on it in his last comments earlier, we'd see the impact of some of these decisions. They'd actually help you as an elected member take on the gravity of the decisions that you're making. The rates have just gone from... We've made now a couple of decisions that have a rate impact, so I just wondered whether you are just about to come to that. OK. Sorry. Um, sorry, I did have one more question, Mark, on policy summary. Um, we did have a submission requesting a LAP uh, for Autaki or for the district, but I'm not sure whether or not you can do it just for a town. Um, I'm wonder wondering how we could finance that or get it up, up the work policy program and, and prioritise it through this LTP process. And possibly you can't, but possibly you can. So could you just let us know? It's, um, we had a big debate about not putting Freedom Camping ahead of it, Councillor. Um, it was in the policy work programme. It was due to start immediately after the beach bylaw was completed. Uh, so the work has commenced. <laughs> so it's started now and will be finishing, oh, take what it takes. <laughs> to, to <laughs> <laughs> Let's all lose the will to live two years. <laughs> Right, thank you very much. Next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, no, this isn't a trick. This is the third, <laughs> third time. The third time we're coming on to the proposed rates increase. Um, we asked the question in a slightly different way. But, um, pretty much what we said is, um, look, the council has proposed a work program. If you accept uh, this work program, that will result in an average rates increase of 7.8%. Please tell us uh, what your views on are. Ah, on a rates increase of 7.8%. Um, so as you can see, um, 98 respondents said they accept it and support the proposals, or 14.6%. Um, 53 respondents said they do accept it but will find it hard to manage. As we'd expect, uh, 200 responses said they don't accept it and think the council should, do, um, should find a different way to deal with cost increases. And interestingly enough, 319 respondents didn't answer the question. So um, Public Voice have, um, as they've done with the other questions, they've provided us with a number of themes, and it's, I guess it's just really a recurring theme. So um, in terms of positive responses of support, um, there was general support. Um, People um, comments included as long as, there, as long as there is value for the increase. So we do, you know, that's common feedback that we get. Um, and then they'll support the work, the work, pre, the work program if the rates increase is lowered. In terms of the um, responses that um, opposed a rates increase of 8.3%, um, we do get, we do get, um, we do, we do um, quite often hear this is that the rates increases should not exceed inflation. And as you know, um, we're uh, our basket of goods is quite different to common household goods, which is why we use the local government cost index. Our, our business operations are different. Um, council spending on unnecessary projects. So, um, <clears throat> so just just a raft of. So the opposition was basically still recovering from COVID nineteen. As you know from the finance update, we did put out a support package, so we are uh, we are working through that still. Um, we did see an equitable increase as our own fair, so part of our rating system review was to make it as, as fair and equitable as possible. And then we did get some ideas, uh, we got some more consultation needed. So, um, so on, on balance, um, <clears throat> I guess the... Um, the feedback really or the, the staff recommendation at this point. So the question was, do you think a 7.8% rates increase is, 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 is fair? Um, we still have to take you through. So you have made some changes already uh, to, the, um, to the fees, the swimming pool, um, spectator and lane um, 
fees, uh, which will have an impact on that 7.8% number. You have um, made a change to the Waikanae Recycling Facility, which will have an impact. We do still have to take you through um, the additional funding requests for your consideration line by line. So um, deliberately, we haven't given you a recommendation yet because 7.8% may well change uh, throughout the course of the night. Actually, I'm really amazed that we actually have hundred percent support for it. That we actually have support. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did, Mr. Mayor. We had twenty-three people made Fourteen point <laughs> six. It wasn't like hundred percent. No reason increase, but we want everything else. Right. Any questions? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. It's not a. It's not a question. It's just a comment. I think all the councillors are really weighing in how hard it is to increase rates, but we're also recognising that we are not willing to vote for things that are not quality uh, decisions for our community, and that's, uh, I think everyone's been weighing those questions very hard, and that includes the things that we've added back, so. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Right. Moving along. Moving along. <laughs> is it me? Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's me. <laughs> So um, the next question was, uh, uh, do you support? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> uh, anyhow, moving on. Um, do you, so the question that we asked is, do you support council exploring other ways to generate an income? That was a yes/no. Um, Thirty-nine point four percent, or two hundred sixty-four respondents said yes. Um, Ten point three percent, or sixty-nine said no. And again, it was a um, it was one of those questions that was largely unanswered. Fifty point three percent of respondents didn't answer the question. In terms of themes, um, we did get obviously some responses. We're in support. Uh, most of that was sitting in a general general support to explore other ways to generate income. Um, and some of the themes that came through, as long as it's cost effective, um, subject to regular auditing, expert input, transparency. And then again, just opposed to rates increases. So if we did actually explore alternate um, income sources, that would, by definition, reduce the uh, reliance on rates to keep rates down. In terms of the opposition, some themes that we saw, again, I guess some sort of common themes is focus on core infrastructure and services only, reduce council spending, general opposition, unsure if council has the expertise to explore alternate revenue sources. Uh, some thoughts on the CCOs came through and uh, alternate revenue sources are unlikely to be cost effective. We did get some ideas, income and generation through the airport, more consultation needed in tourism was, um, was, was the results that came back to us. So the, consult the consultation question, there were two, sorry. Um, so the proposed rates increases for 21-22, as I said, we've got to take you through some additional slides yet, so we are remaining non-committal on a recommendation to you at this point. And then exploring other ways to generate income, absolutely yes, based on the submission responses. We know that if we can get where reliant, 78 percent of our revenue comes through rates, and um, if we can find uh, additional revenue sources that will make our reliance on rates less, and hopefully, fingers crossed, the rates increases less as well. Okay, um, <clears throat> gets a bit tricky from now on in. And um, dinner is still somewhere else. Okay, um, look, I'm going to do a, quite, a, quite a quick financial overview, but not like any I've ever done before. So we, you know, where we got to, we went out to cons con consultation, we were 7.8%. We showed you what the ca CapEx profile was. We showed you what our journey was. So we're just going to really get into the heart of the, of the decisions tonight, really. So um, please let me take you through the slide line by line. There's, um, there's some things there that... That, that, that I do need to tell you, um, but I don't, I, don't, well, I don't necessarily want you to run with it straight away, okay? So I need to talk to you about insurance. <laughs> so, um, look, our starting position, as you know, we've consulted on 7.8%. Um, 
and what we've done, as we always do, we, we keep on looking at our at our budgets, we refine, we look we look for ways that we can reduce costs um, right up to the right up to the eighteenth of June. You know, we're constantly looking at ways that we can somehow somehow reduce rates. But um, and a couple of things that we um, have happened very recently is obviously there's been a change in legislation. So in terms of our rates remission budget of four hundred and eight thousand dollars, in that is fifty thousand dollars, and that's um, for us to remit rates on Maori freehold land. So with the change in legislation, we don't have to remit that anymore. We just say non-rateable. We don't rate them, so we don't we don't actually have to remit anything. So what the proposal is, is there's $50,000 in the budget that you can either say take out, we're going to take that as a savings, or you can reassign it, you know, potentially to offset the costs of the changes that you've already made tonight. Um, so there's, there's 50000 that's, um, for want of a better expression, it's up for grabs. So you have the decision. You can reduce the budget by 50 or you can reallocate it. Insurance. So we've worked very hard with our insurers and we've actually just... Um, just recently, we've actually only just finalised our reinsurance um, for underground assets, above ground assets, and all our small little insurances of our motor vehicles and stuff. And um, look, the whole way along, we've been working with Aon. They've indicated a 30% premium increase. We obviously factored that into the budgets. We um, so our budgets include a include an insurance premium of 2.2.3 million dollars. Um, we've actually done a lot of work behind the scenes. We've worked really closely with Aon. We've looked at all the assets that we insure, and we've actually identified a number of, um, or a large number of, of low-value assets that we've actually felt the councils before us have had a zero, basically our policy has been zero risk, and we've just insured everything. So we've insured all our playgrounds, we've insured all the retaining walls, you know, just everything. So we've, we've gone through, we've worked with activity managers, we've worked with the senior leadership team, and we've actually said, well, look, if in the event of a major, major earthquake, um, would we reinstate all the playgrounds straight away? Would we put all those retaining walls in? Are there assets there that actually we wouldn't replace immediately and use the budgets that we've got in our long-term plan? So we've actually we've actually identified low-risk assets that we actually feel that in terms we don't actually need to insure, and that's had an impact on our premium. So we've actually managed to fend off. So so the mark the market out there is tight. Insurers do think we're really risky. There has been a 20% premium increase, so the syndicate's premiums have gone up 20%. But because we've been working so hard with Aon, looking at our assets, understanding the risk behind our assets, um, we've actually been able to come in $450,000 below budget. Okay. But so, so on the slide, there's there's $450,000 that. Um, it's really for your decision. So you can actually say take $450,000 out of the budget, but that's certainly not what we're going to recommend. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the pressures that we're facing with our insurance. In the past, we've, we've offered up those savings. We've said premiums have come down, let's strip it out. And then events have happened, and then we've been at the mercy of the market, and premiums have gone up and up and up and up and up. And we're, we're in the same position still. So underwriters do think we're risky, and we're back on what's called technical rates, and um, we have to find ways of becoming more and more and more attractive to the market because the underwriters are now starting to pick and choose because they want to make money. So, but anyhow, we'll take you through the slide. So there's 50K up for grabs. Our, budget, our budgeted insurance premium is $450 more than what we need. So that's, that's money that's potentially available, but we don't recommend it. So based on those numbers there, they would take your rates increase down from 7.8 to 7.1. We're going to take you through, um, we've, we've looked at all the additional funding requests. We've identified, uh, we, we're recommending some of them that you should, you should consider. And so we've created a buffer of 200K for you. Um, and that actually comes from two things. We've said to you, we've been modelling our um, our first year, or our, our rates growth of 0.9%, uh, or sorry, the growth in our rating rating base has been 0.9%. We think we are, uh, we're currently tracking a little bit stronger than normal. We know when we look at the finance update, our rates revenue is always a little bit stronger because in terms of the timing, uh, for the last few years, we've always ended up with slightly more uh, rateable properties than what we anticipate because of when we set the rates. But we think we're on track at the moment to have um, growth of 
1.1 to 1.2 percent. Our rates manager is extremely nervous about 1.2 percent, and I have to say this is an estimate. We can see stuff in the pipeline. We can't say with certainty that um, we're going to get certificates of title by 30th of June, but it's certainly looking like we're going to have stronger growth this financial year. Okay. So um, what we've had a look at is how have we just come up with 200k? What we're saying, well, if growth is going to be stronger than what we anticipated, if you wanted to flatline your rates at 7.8% increase, you've actually got the ability to actually put some money in because your growth is, is higher than what we anticipated, you can actually you can put that growth into your budget but still come out, come out at 7.8%. So it's 50k for the um, rates remission for Maori free old land rates, which, which, you can, which you can decide to use. And then with the extra growth, you can actually put another $150,000 into your OPEX budget. So that's how we've come up with the 200k. Really don't recommend that we actually give up this 450k for insurance. We really do need to become attractive. We need to position ourselves better than everybody else for our um, underwriters. But we also need to um, have, a, have, a, have a frank discussion about we need to use some of that money. The rates increase right now for year two is 8.2% um, and year three is 8.5%. And we need to do a lot of work on our depreciation. It's our depreciation, our impairment, our, how we manage it, how we're accounting for our assets. And we want to use a little bit of the money, a little bit of that 450 to be able to do that because year two's rates increase is sitting really, really high. So we're wanting, we're wanting to hold that to grow our self-insurance fund so that we are more attractive to the underwriters, but also to do a piece of work that we haven't budgeted for, which needs to be done. So, um, so what we're saying, to take you through, so if you add back 200k to your budget to um, fund some of those additional funding requests, you put the 450k, uh, you don't take the 450k out, we, um, we put that in a self-insurance fund and we, and we use it, you will get to a rates increase of 8%, but we've said that growth is 0.9%. We, th we think we're going to hit 1.1, so your growth is 0.2% stronger than what we've anticipated. So you go from 8 to take 0.2% off, leaves you at a, a headline average rates increase of 7.8%. So put simplistically, don't touch insurance. We need that. We have, because of stronger growth, we, you can take, you can increase your OPEX budgets by two hundred thousand dollars, to still have an average rates increase of seven point eight percent. The two hundred thousand dollars you could use for the changes that you've already made tonight, but there are some uh, compelling additional funding requests that we'd like to take you through in, in later slides. Um, Mr. Jackson, I know you're itching to say something. Can you start? I, I certainly support the insurance, and I've been involved in this. It's, a, it's an issue everywhere. Um, don't tuck it away. Don't let it go anywhere because you'll need it. The Audit and Risk Committee did ask for an overview of insurance, and it's very important we add a risk uh, for this change so that we know exactly uh, what this could uh, mean so that it can be constantly reviewed. Just if I can chip in with a little bit, not too much. Um, because we are, um, if you like, heightening our risk by not insuring everything, um, the prudent thing to do is to start to set aside a little bit of money ourselves towards that. And as you know, three years ago, we managed to make a whole space for a whole $150,000 a year. Now, um, to my mind, we need a self-insurance reserve in the order of 10 to 20 million. So putting that aside at $150,000 a year, you could just you know, get the calculators out. Um, <laughs> I won't even be dribbling in a rocking chair before we get there. Um, so, so How do we know? <laughs> <laughs> this gets us closer to, to what I would say um, is, is an appropriate amount to be setting aside um, towards that balance of risk uh, mitigation. Um, subject, you know, it is appropriate that Auden Risk will take a view on that so um, as well. So that's the insurance thing you're talking about. Correct, yeah. Thank you, Sri, Mr. Mayor. So, what number of um, increase? What is that increase that we've agreed to tonight? The two decisions that you made. 
Yeah, so I don't know if Andrew's got it on, but um, if we just stay at the 7.8%, the changes that we made take us to 8.07%. And if you take the... So that you... And you've still got 200k of recommendations, which is 0.3 to go on top of that. It's within that. It's within that. It's within that. Within that. Thank you. Um, and because I'm a little bit thick, um, a little bit. A lot. Um, <laughs> the idea that we're putting money aside uh, into some amorphous place that we might use should there be a disaster, that is what you're effectively saying. And instead of insuring, we're just putting reserves aside. Yeah, thanks through, Mr Mayor. Look, thank you, Councillor. So, um, no, it's a really good question, and uh, we will be doing we will we will be doing a formal report to audit and risk with a presentation and a deep dive, and it's something that we haven't haven't brought to this table for a long time. So what we're saying is yes, exactly that. We are creating a self insurance fund. So initially, at the level that it's at, it's for uninsured losses. So um, if we had a major disaster um, for underground assets, our excess is a million dollars for every single event. So we have to front up the first million dollars. For above ground assets, it's 5% of the sum insured. So currently we have $200 million of uh, above ground assets. Now that's for our business interruption. So what we're saying is we want to divert this into the self-insurance fund, but what we're actually, what we're also saying is at the moment, the way we account for it is it's sitting, it's, it's a book entry on our balance sheet in equity. And what we want to do is this gets, um, as this as grows, we actually want to put that into a separate cash fund. So you can actually see it on the balance sheet in terms of cash. So rate payers can actually see there's a self-insurance fund. You're rating me so that you're, um, I'm not, if you've got uninsured losses, you're not going to go and borrow money. Uh, you've actually got a small fund that you've rate funded me to, 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 to be able to pay for these uninsured losses. Can I ask though, when rate payers are obviously, you know, this is a rate increase. If there was an act, uh, God forbid, another disaster and we needed to uh, change our insurance, we would have we would have borrowed less and therefore still be able to borrow to create this fund. So I'm just missing something in this conversation as to why we need to hold on to the money when technically we could borrow it later if there was an issue. Because if we've paid it back, then we've lowered our debt or... So um, <coughs> let's say this building burnt down, um, you may well find that financial markets haven't shifted. There's a greater than seven magnitude earthquake in the Wellington region. Um, you can expect financial markets to be incredibly unsettled, and you cannot be sure that even your existing funding lines will remain in place. So that's part of the risk that we have to balance. Is um, so what what happened after the GFC, for example, which wasn't a natural hazard disaster, but um, uh, uh, cost of borrowing spiked big time, and uh, natural hazard disasters in New Zealand can potentially have the same impact on cost of borrowing. So. So, so that whole mix is um, if you totally rely on the cost of borrowing, you could well find you're up for a greater cost than if you can cover some of the first response yourself through your own reserves. And that makes total sense, but all our other borrowing based on that scenario would go up. So we would only be affecting 450k of our potential borrowing. Talking, it's not going to happen this year. <laughs> okay. The building's not going to burn down one <laughs> um, this is about this is about building this up year on year on year. So we'll we'll set aside um, uh, the amount every year. You'll see it building up in the fund, and at the point that it gets to um, to, to draw you an example with a, with another council, say Greater Wellington's got something like a twenty million dollar self insurance reserve. Uh, Wellington City is also setting aside about half a million a year, I think, or maybe more now. That was ten years ago. And the, the point of all that is, you you can then. Um, you can then change what it's going to cost you to reinstate because you're paying the first most expensive layer yourself. Then insurance kicks in. Um, and you're absolutely right. If we're going to have to borrow for some of that um, going forward, um, those costs can be affected and it will impact on your work program. So Christchurch earthquakes, absolutely an example. Both the availability of, of labour supply and the uncertainty in the financial markets had an impact on what it cost you to build stuff. Yes. Thank you. Um, can I ask what either happened to the funding that we put aside for a fund of exactly this nature in Triennium 2013 to 2016? 
and possibly extending to the next one because mm -hmm. I don't ever remember a decision that said that that uh, saving uh, was was stopped. We've done this. And did we spend it in COVID? Did we spend it with COVID? So, so through you, Mr. Mayor. No, thank you, Councillor. So we. Um, the decision was made that year on year we would start, we would commence the self-insurance fund. It was $150,000 per year OPEX, which would be rate funded, uh -huh. and there was a budget provision CAPEX of 250000 because in a loss event, some pertains to, if it's if it's just repair and maintenance, it op, it's OPEX, if it's replacement of an asset, it's CAPEX. So fortunately for the last two financial years, the $150,000 has accumulated to $300,000, so we haven't, we haven't had to use it. Um, there's a slide coming up, our CapEx budget. So with CapEx, we provide a budget for $250,000 a year for uninsured losses. If we don't use it, we propose to carry it over. That's sitting at $771,000 so far. So okay. it's there. Oh, cash. Um, it, it's, look, it's, it's, it's not, no, it's not cash. Um, we, we've, we, we, we've, um, We've basically treated it as an accounting entry in equity, but what we're saying is because it's so small, we don't we don't want a hundred jam jars. We've actually worked oh. very hard to actually simplify and tidy up our finances. But what we are saying, with a self insurance fund in the order of ten million, fifteen million plus, you'd absolutely have it as a cash fund. Okay, right. So what if you could so it a supplementary question? So what if you could do your cash fund? Uh, what if we could also satisfy the ratepayers that have come to us with requests for funding um, and their submissions? That, that, um, on my list here was, is that adding up to 1.5 mil um, and, and then there's the cost of that waste facility. What if we could do all that and still have money um, to spend? So what I'm proposing is that we take a project that was put on the last LTP that's not started yet and we actually cancel that project and put $2.43 million back into the budget, the working budget, as a COVID response for this council and to help reduce the rate, proposed rates increase. So you know what I'm asking about and I'm just going to put it out there. I would far, I would far rather at this post-COVID time, and, um, and we are having a long recovery with massively increased cost of living for everyone. Boy, I know it. I, I had to have my dishwasher fixed last, last week. I know what the bill was. Um, and I really, really think that it's our priority at this particular time um, to try and keep things as a recovery model. Um, Help our ratepayers pay rates. I'd like to put two point, take two point four three million dollars of ex, of expected and budgeted for expenditure, and uh, to stop that project and put it back into our balance sheet for the next few years. So um, I'm sure um, when it comes to the bit that we talked about, that at the end, if there's new other items you want to raise, that's where mm. you would raise it. See if you've got support from the table. Um, yeah. Just want to um, be really clear, and I'll repeat it when you when you raise whatever it is. Um, you probably it sounds to me like you're talking about a capex project, so that doesn't affect the rates increases. Certainly not in year one. Um, and depending on what the project is, it may see some small savings in years two and three. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't equate to the millions of dollars of capex. It relates to the life of the asset and um, what okay. depreciation and interest charges that you save would be. Um, that's absolutely your choice to raise at the time. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to signal at this point, Mark, because you're doing the, these, um, these figures, these spreadsheets here, and, and some of us have had some real creative thinking going on and been making some quite hard, hard choices. Through you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. I think um, whilst whilst everyone retreats for dinner, we'll probably just update that slide with um, what you're more accustomed to seeing, where where we're at, because I I suspect over the the slides that follow, we will um, go up and down. Um, so it'll be important to see where we land. But um, look, the point that I um, I'll, leave, I'll look. I'll leave it there. I just wanted to make the point. We heard from the CFO last week that you know, in terms of our process, we always, um, at some point in time, we bring to you what the proposed capex carryovers are. So um, we do generally uh, always have to carry some capital projects over that haven't quite finished. Um, we detail why. 
And so what you what what um, councillors would have seen last week is at the moment it's sitting at 1.9 million dollars in addition to what's actually been factored into the in, factored in the 7.8 percent already is capex carryovers of 1.1 million. So we're just flagging to you at the moment that's sitting at another 1.9 million. And what you would have heard the CFO CFO say is that does give you some small relief um, because that means if the project's not finished, it's not, uh, we haven't borrowed the money to finish it, so we've got some savings on interest, and it's, if it's not finished, it's not in use, which means it's not been depreciated. So at the moment, we're sitting at um, $3.1 million, so it's still, still small change. So there's just a comment there just to remind you that um, when we bring the paper on the 24th of June, there will be some discussion in the paper around the, the final capex carryovers that, that will, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be seeking your approval to um, carry over uh, unspent capex money, and it'll have an impact on the rates through um, interest and depreciation. But at this level, it's small fry. Um, and, that, and that's just a repeat. So there's the 771 relating to the, um, the CapEx provision for uninsured losses for capital items, for assets. That just need to be outright replaced, not repaired. Um, the digital workplace project, um, I was quite passionate about that. That's, in, that's a business improvement cross-council work program, IT-based. The college, the Parapara Umu College gym, the Tasman Road, and the Waikanae duplicate rising main. So all of that adds up to 1.9. And as I said, we've already factored into our budget a uh, $1.1 million carryover. I certainly don't want to labour the point, um, but I do want to just talk to you very briefly about, yes, we are doing a deep dive. Um, we will be bringing back a strategy. We will be proposing. So the Chief Executive just said, so we purchase our insurance in layers. So you get primary layers, secondary layers. So generally in terms of how we structure our insurance cover, it's in layers of $100 million now. Typically what happens is insurers have, um, they demand a higher return on the capital that, are, that they put up for that first hundred million because in, in losses that's the first hundred million that gets called on. So they know they're going to pay it out in losses, so it's more expensive. Now over the last four years, so we've got six layers of insurance, we go all the way up to 600 million. So typically layers three, four and five and six at the top are really cheap because they don't get called on that much. So what's happening now is because all these underwriters are making significant losses, and what that means is that what, they, what they're taking in from premiums is far less than what they're paying out. All the layers are extremely expensive. There's almost no differentiation between the primary layer and the secondary layer. So what we have to do is we have to be attractive to the market. So it's building that $10, $15 million as, as, a, as a layer that we can call on. It's a fund that we can call on for uninsured losses before the underwriters even kick in. And the strategy that we're looking at and working on is called ventilated cover. So it's basically looking at our layers and saying, well, where these underwriters are charging us huge amounts, we'll actually buy our own insurance. Okay, there's a lot of work that still has to go into this, but we have to find ways of actually um, being attractive. When underwriters start to see your self-insurance, whether it's ventilated cover, where you've got, you know, you've got access to a huge fund, you become more attractive to them, their rates go down. Um, the other thing that we'll be talking to you about is called protect to sell. Okay, this is basically where you you go to a, a, a company, an insurance company, where you put a sum of cash into the insurance company, and that's almost its own layer of insurance. So you've got your own self-insurance fund, then you go to a protected sell before the underwriter's insurance even kicks in. So you become a lot more attractive now. That's a good strategy because that money is never lost from the ratepayers. So year on year, when we, so when we rate fund an insurance premium increase of 30% but don't have any losses, the ratepayers have lost. So they've paid for the insurance, and I think in this room all of us will know someone who actually cancelled their insurance and really needed it. So insurance is one of those things, you don't have it when you really need it, and you've got it when you don't. So there's lots of things we need to start shifting. We need to still look at our, at our, asset, our assets. We need to look at, um, in terms of our infrastructure network, is there opportunities to identify parts of our network that's not critical, that doesn't need to be insured? Parts of it will be critical, parts of it may not be. But we've got a lot of work to do. Um, we've got to build this fund because um, you, bet your you bet your bottom dollar, next year there'll be another 30% premium increase. And if anything happens, It'll be more. So it's been a real struggle to get our cover. So we have to have insurance strategy. We have to follow that strategy. And it's penny wise, pound foolish. 
is $450,000. This is an opportunity to actually start building a fund to be more attractive to the market. Our renewal is in 12 months time and it's going to come around just like that. So um, I'd really, really like us not to use it if that's possible. So Mark, <laughs> is this something that you've worked out or Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So through you, um, so we, we benefit from being part of a syndicate with Aon that also looks after Wellington City Council. We we know from the conversations that we've had, the syndicate that we that we're in is actually far more advanced than other syndicates. We understand we've we've agreed how we allocate our premiums. We we all agree to review our assets and do um, critical network analysis. Um, both ourselves and Wellington City are talking to Aon about well, what kind of cover would we get if we just help, if we just froze our premium? So if we went to the market and we said we're not going to we're not going to accept any premium increases, what sort of cover would we get? We're all starting to talk about ways and means of better positioning ourselves to the market because of the pressures. So having said that, without going into a deep dive, mm. three orders, so <laughs> just a couple of sentences, if possible. Yeah, transfer all the risk to the new owner and they'll have to insure it. And so um, that's over 300 million of our 600 million underground assets. Um, so yeah, you'll see a big change in theory um, to, to what it costs us, um, which is good. Um, I just want to add in that um, um, about eight or 10 years ago, just before I started here, our insurance premiums were 400,000 per annum. After Christchurch, they trebled. Mm -hmm and that got everyone focused. They went to 1.3 million, actually. Then they started to slowly come down, and you've just heard Mark say what they are now. And when it's getting to this kind of number, you start getting very invested in trying to look at what's the right balance of risk and, and return for that cost. So it's at a level where we're really focused on it. So the key for me... We're being told we must continue as it, and you know yeah. this, of course, we're being told we must continue as if we will continue to own it. So I shouldn't ask the question, sorry. Well, look, no, it's a really <laughs> a seriously great question because uh, the government is looking at which councils are playing it. And if you were to take a highly risky approach, you'd say, you know what, let's not insure our three waters because the government's going to take them and let's save a few hundred thousand dollars. Well, wow, um, I, I could not support any approach like that. but, mm. but uh, councils are, are, are seriously looking at do we need to depreciate, do we need to fund, do we need to insure, and that's really dangerous stuff to do because it's about the outcome for the for the uh, ratepayer. Mark or Wayne, I mean it's quite a complex topic that not all councillors would have their heads around. My understanding is you're raising it tonight simply f to put the plea out there to keep the 450 in, and is it fair to say that we could bring this back to a more comprehensive briefing to walk elected members through that insurance layering and process because I think it'd be good that we can move on but as long as we understand you want to move on and the understanding that we you're at pains to point out that we keep that 450 in. Through you Mr Mayor, absolutely Councillor, yes of course we can do that, we can do more detail on a, on a subsequent briefing. Um, I do need to let you know that there's funding available to you to reduce your budgets but um, looking long term, it's, it's something that we would recommend that you keep in our budgets. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. It's just, it's just information. Again, it's all part of getting a clear steer. You have, you have before you a number of slides with additional funding requests, and you may want to bring your own requests to the table. So um, you do need to just obviously be transparent and let you know what we found since we um, uh, went out on consultation, w consulted on a draft increase of 7.8%. This is what's happened since then. Okay, so now's the fun bit. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> okay, more fun. <laughs> Um, so all the proposals that we've received from um, community asking for either additional funding or advocacy and support are in the next 13 slides. Um, so there's a lot to get through. Um, 
some of the proposals you hear during hearings, some people didn't come and speak to their proposal. Um, for the purposes of trying to get them all on a slide, we've um, wrapped up so some submissions that you got went into quite a lot of detail and had several points. Um, we've wrapped it up into a table so there's just one line per submitter um, with the recommendation alongside it, but we can talk as we go. Um, as Mark identified, um, we have brought some to the table that the recommendation is that we think we should support in some way and that is starting to use up the extra $200,000 that was signalled as a bit of headroom within the existing rates number. Um, there are a lot that are already in the work programme um, or um, have been noted for future discussion. So we'll, we'll talk you through it. Um, we'll see how many we can get through before dinner. Okay, so the first slide are the ones where um, it's the staff recommendation that we do um, include in some way. Um, so first off is Paparamu College, um, so the request to provide an alternative entrance to the college cycle parking area. Um, so we've estimated at a cost of 60,000 capex um, with the rates impact of 0 0.001. Um, could achieve what was requested, and we're recommending that that is included. So, just to get it clear, um, we're going to go through all this and then come back to each one. Or do you want? As we go. Because uh, then you can't compare. Yeah. But it's hard. But, but it's kind of why we've said context-wise, um, these are the financial ones. Mm. Uh, you've already raised some other things so far today, so you can you can you can see these. Uh, most of the others we don't think have a financial impact. So it's probably better, given you can pretty much see them here, that you talk to them individually now, um, unless we get completely stuck down a rabbit hole. Uh, Andrew has got the spreadsheet at the back, so we are tracking the numbers as we go. If there's anything in addition to what we are. Recommending, we just can't have it up on the screen time, same time on the screen, obviously. So but at any time, we'll be able to update you on what the rates number is if other things are proposed to be included, um, and then we'll summarise. And then there's obviously the opportunity at the end of this for councillors to bring anything to the table that we haven't picked up on. So, just clarity: the two hundred thousand that uh, you've already included as part of the submissions, the um, proposals that have been given the tick. That's included in that 200,000. Is that correct? Yep. Just want to clarify that. Thank you. Not to hold up um, the progress we're about to make. I'm very uncomfortable if we just go through. Um, saying yes, no, yes, no, because I think councillors, we can't see the totality, so maybe we could give an initial indication, but then I really think we've got to come back and go, we need to weigh some of these up, potentially. That's my concern. Yep, so that's what's proposed, so Andrew's keeping the running total, we'll be able to give you an update, and then also by the end of the night we should be able to say where we've landed, and then we've got the wrap up on... Tuesday as well, so we can bring everything back in its context and get yes. final. So do you have, when you add all these up, according to your recommendations, do you have a figure at the end? Um, so at the moment, all of these recommendations are within the 7.8 number. Okay. That's good no. It's on LG Hub. Can I just check? Um, are you open for some questions? I appreciate you probably just want to get into the presentation. Same. Um, no, nah, Manu, um, forgive me for not re remembering the exact figures. And one of the questions that I did have was whether that could be pushed out over further years to reduce the impact. Then I don't see that as exactly what's here. But shouldn't that, given that that was in. Included in the 7.8%, shouldn't that have had a 
a negative impact in terms of the net rates giving more headroom? What we put in the draft was um, over years two and three, oh, okay. uh, they asked that we bring some money forward, in fact, and so it's 50000 into year one. So it's the same amount of money spread over three years, but starting in year one, so that is an increase. Yeah, okay, that, that makes more sense. Okay, so if we're just working down um, the list, so Paparama College, tick. <laughs> now, can I just check that? I mean, I imagine this has gone through stuff, and obviously I hold the writing portfolio. My only, um, you know, I think I had this comment with Guru or one of the others around, it, from an elected member's perspective, I'm reluctant to promote roading and transport projects that really should be um, tested through the expertise of the staff around priority. So say putting this as a higher priority over, you know, know for example, there's the Parapara Umu, um, the um, other school there, which has the bus going down through it down, is it Glen Road or whatever from Grey Avenue. Avenue. So I'm not opposed to this. I'm just, usually it's, does this come with a staff? I mean, I imagine because it's in there, it comes with staff support. Um, it actually already was in the work program within CWB, so um, it's been advised by the roading manager that it would be worth bringing forward like this. So even though it's already in, it wasn't in the budget for whatever particular year, because I think if it's in there, there should be budget in there already for it. So what you're saying is it's to be brought forward? Oh. Yes. I said in year three, the, um, <laughs> it was from a CWB perspective, the, that's the context around it, there's the access from the school down alongside, I'm trying to, yeah, yeah, so that, that was, I guess that's what's not why it's part of the safety improvement and the general work that sits within access and transport, this is within the CWB program and they're suggesting you can bring it forward um, in terms of, um, or priorities that are already in that list of works. I'm not sure what's funded next year from the CWB point of view, probably only the Toroto Oteki works. If that gives you a bit of context around the... Um it means that the CWB will be reprioritised, so it's enabling... So the CWB budget um, sits in one sum of money and we work with the CWB advisory group and others to um, prioritise those. So this coming forward just means that we'll be able to do other CWB projects earlier. And also in CAPEX, it's only a very small amount. <laughs> so, so the next one um, is in response to the submission made by Ramati Village Business Association, but this isn't um, just for the purposes of that. So in general, um, the recommendation is including an additional 10,000 annually that will allow um, us to work with different sectors of the community as appropriate across town centre planning. <laughs> no, there were about there were about three groups who asked for it, and so we said um, uh, let's put in a notional amount to signal that we do want to respond to those um, localised um, responses, and th that really is a notional amount to kick it off and then see what flows out of it. Uh, we haven't even really said that it's necessarily aromatic. They have to be really nice to us. Um, <laughs> Um, Reed was really nice. He was. It, it was a fantastic submission, I thought, yeah. and a very, a very uh, collaborative and, and positive presentation. Um, but it also made a good point, 
and, and so, but, but we, we are aware that there were others as well. So we, we felt that we're not going to pick favourites. We'll put it in every year. We'll come back to you and say, uh, actually, we've worked it up and this is who we'll work with. So I'm saying it, it, there's a good chance it'll be a Romatty, just so as we can get two people happy. Um, uh, it might be a good chance it might be somewhere else so that we can keep someone else happy as well. <laughs> Oh, sorry. So, in terms of this ten thousand, so you're saying that that ten thousand would be for a different community each year, or that's for Romati ongoing from year one what, to be discussed. <laughs> yeah. What? I did, just just a bit of clarity on that because I don't quite. Yeah. Not the latter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well. Yeah, that's kind of okay. Not so um, we're doing this in a hurry, yeah. okay? I get um, the sense that it, yeah, it's for Romati. Yeah, uh, I think you got the sense this? of it. You got the sense of well, it, not the dollars. Um, so, so, so um, <laughs> there's, a, there's a little bit of work that we've been slowly trying to build into around local outcomes. And um, uh, when we put some resources in place, it was on the people side, but there wasn't any money for them to do anything. And um, this is a little way of saying, so we're just going to take another little bite at that and grow that resource a little bit, mm -hmm. that it is a positive response to Romaddy, but um, uh, I'm not going to 100% say to you that's who it will be or that they'll have all of it or that that's enough for them. So it could be it could be that we try and do a little bit in um, I don't know um, Portaki, <laughs> Portaki, uh, Paikakariki, because um, there's a whole lot of town centres work going on related to expressways as well, and we've already got budgets for that. This is a little bit about working on on a local outcome at a at a village level, yeah, um, and a little bit of resource to help do that consultation with those groups to see what comes out of it. So um, it isn't any one group forever or any one group necessarily. It's a little bit of resource to say to the team, right, go and do some consultation, spend some time working with them, see what you get. Let's say, super optimistically, we only needed 2,500 for Romaddy. We might have 7,500 to spend on someone else. It's very optimistically I'm saying that. But okay, yeah, no, I think, I think probably where I was getting a little bit confused is just because it, it's as, it seems like it's as a direct response to the Romaddy Village Business Association oh, submission, oh, yeah. which was... It is, yeah. but also that there were others. Okay, yeah. And I, can I just add, um, I think that that also adds to um, previous years' worth of submissions from community groups wanting um, council representation in their ED space. And I think that this is a really good outcome. It's a little bit, but um, it certainly, I can certainly see it benefiting, particularly business associations when they have um, a group of people working to better that area. Um, and let's hope that there are more business associations that crop up so council has one direct um, voice to work with or group to work with as opposed to ad hoc different businesses around the place. I, I can see it working, thank you. Um, so next is Na Manu and just proposing that we are readjusting the funding um, that was originally in the draft budget um, to better suit their needs, so spread it, spreading it out over um, years one, two and three, um, so that changes the rates impact to 0 0.07 for year one. 0.15 for year two and 0.15 for year three. Right. Any issues with that? Well, I uh, look, just um, just want a little bit of clarity. We talked about the 200,000 um, encompassing the proposed suggestions here, uh, which is great. Um, but just how does that impact with regards to year two and three? Uh, is that a carried through sort of thing, or is that already factored into those years now as well? Um, it's actually a, so it'll be a very slight reduction in year two and year two, and an increase in year three. Because it was year one and two. Yeah, it? so it's a, it's a good question, councillor. Broadly, all of the stuff we're talking about is the year one impact, yeah. um, but we will show you any flow on impacts if they go into years two and three. If you take the ten thousand dollars, for example, you you get hit with it once, and if it stays there forever, there's no more increase in rates yeah. impact. Um, but that Namanu one, because it's a little variable, will have a small impact up and down. Um, next is Otaki Collins. 
Thank you. Uh, look, this is a um, bit of an odd one, um, but what we did read through some of the submissions, oh, I was quite surprised that there was a lot of support for No Money, given that it's a private entity. But the other aspect of the feedback was around them considering a local rate. Um, and I think actually they, I don't know, we're providing the funding whether that feedback can go back through to them because it's for the first time potentially rate payers are putting money into that organisation. Um, for something that's quite exciting, um, but I think in doing so it would be responsible for us to ask them to consider a community rate for entry for those that live in the area. So, sorry, I made that clear at the start, but yeah, just in terms of admission, like that whole like Splash Planet has a local rate for people that live in the uh, residents of that area. I know, I know what most of these organisations will say back to you. It's called annual membership, because um, ah. that is at a discount and encourages you to go more. And the more more you go, of course, the more value you get for your expenditure. But uh, but nonetheless, whilst that's what they would say, um, we're happy to take that forward as a as a part of our reply. Um, so, Otaki College, and this is similar um, to the Ramadi Village Business Association, and as far as these, um, we've put this in response to Otaki College, but it's not just for this submission. There were others that came through Otaki that will talk you through um, that this would relate to. So, um, we're proposing to raise the social investment fund by $50,000 specifically for Otaki, um, which will help look into um, what we want, what Andy was asking for um, up there from that social hub point of view. Um, and then specifically for the, this submission, um, start to look at an Otaki community facilities review. Um, but the $50,000 for the investment fund would be a rates impact of 0 0.07. Thank you. If I may, Mr Mayor, if I can just add to what Alison was saying. What we've proposed is an increase in the social investment fund specifically tagged to Ōtaki to reflect um, the range of equity issues that were highlighted um, across the submissions. Obviously, um, some of them related to youth, but there was also a general um, tenor through the submissions uh, that uh, council potentially doesn't understand um, or Taki doesn't understand its needs, isn't always present or, or visible, and a clear sense that Ōtaki had a, a specific set of needs that was different to the rest of the district. And um, that is what this proposal attempts to address. Um, by, by proposing an increase in the social investment fund, it um, creates an opportunity for the broader outcomes um, that the council and the communities we serve are seeking to be considered before confirming exactly what that funding would be used for. Thank you, Treating Mr Mayor. Dennis and I have had a chat today. Um, and one of the things as a um, social wellbeing portfolio holder I wanted to make clear was that I thought there was some real need that was being um, voiced to us from Ōtaki and while I think the proposal has merit, I'm really reluctant to, to go through a very long, what, what could be a long council process um, if we were speaking to the youth part of it to, to come up with a solution. And I've certainly had another number of conversations around the room with councillors that there is um, quite a little bit of support to try and do something quickly and as a quick fix with a view to a longer term solution. So I was specifically um, focused on a youth hub and what we could do to facilitate that, and making sure that it was uh, led by people from Ōtaki, uh, made sure that it had a youth voice and that it um, involved at least two councillors, Sophie and um, uh, Councillor Coots because of the area. So I, I think while the proposal um, is a good long-term solution, I don't see it as the short-term solution that is required. And the other thing I think I mentioned was the need to make sure that it sits outside of the school um, because mm -hmm. there are, uh, will always be uh, youth who are not part of the school community anymore for whatever reasons. And 
just emphasise that when we keep youth engaged in our community in whatever, the outcomes are so much better than the alternative when they become disenfranchised by their community. And I think we've got a lack of resources in that part of our electorate, and this short-term fix can lead to a longer-term solution, but I think we've got to do things slightly differently. More specific and more immediate. Yes, very much, Mia. Absolutely, I think we should be focusing on a youth hub, and we should be activating it very, very quickly, rather than going through a, a longer process where we work out what the community needs and wants. I think we've heard what the community wants. We've just got to find a way to make it happen quickly and then we can look at the broader issues of what that community needs because I think there is an under-representation in this area specifically for you is the focus that I've had. So um, I, I hear you and what I want to say is um, I, I would caution you about a knee-jerk decision today about what you think the answer is. Um, so, uh, you know, straight after that impassioned plea, I'm out the door talking to Andy and his two colleagues. And um, I, I would say that for us to make a decision today about what we want to spend the money on runs the risk of actually upsetting as many people as it pleases. So a simple example is he said one of the, one of the highest priorities as far as he's concerned is to make Ngāpūrapūra more accessible for young people. Um, we can because we can provide um, all, all subsidies to the, to the users rather than to the owner as we would do with our own halls. Now, I'm not saying we should do that. I'm saying that's what he said. He saw immediately as the top priority. And you've jumped to, no, it's a youth venue. Now, I'm not saying either is right or wrong. I do think we need a little bit of time to engage with people and, and find the best use of that money. And I hear what you're saying about don't stick your head up your backside and think about it for the next nine months and then only have three months to spend it. Um, and and our, we need to assure you that's not the plan um, and that it's not an overly onerous um, part of the social grants process, but I would recommend to you that you need to put some rigour around it and ask the community a little more widely um, about what would be the best use of that. That's my, that's my advice. Um, look, I've got an alternative proposal which I'll bring up in the councillor's um, session, um, but I need to say that the social investment approach touches on a number of submissions. There's, there's a couple of discussions here. One's around those social issues. The second one is around a youth space. So I'll bring that back to the table in a more broader discussion that I've had with other fellow elected members. But I, I, I'd be looking at more um, and be looking at, one, the youth space, and secondly, the social issues, e.g. driver's licensing and so forth. But I'll, I'll speak to that more <clears throat> in more detail when we come to the councillor section. Yeah, I was going to comment. I thought this could wrap up um, Shelley, Shelley Wright's and um, Adrian Gregory's uh, submissions as well in the same conversation. Oh, I think that's fine as long as there's a further conversation in the in the next section, but it sounds like there will be, so. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question through the Mayor. What does that extra 50000 take our total social investment fund to now, if this went ahead? I'm going to need to come back to you with that answer. Thank you, Mr Chair. So, um, in the last um, 10 days or so, we've we had quite a long um, report back from Zeal. And I'm just wondering how, you know, whether they're involved in any of this work or, or because obviously they have got, you know, some big um, inputs into Otaki. Um, and then, so uh, 
proposed recommendation for the Kapiti Economic Development Board um, around including an additional $50,000 to the existing budget um, at a rates impact of 0.07%. Yes, not anymore. Well, um, so we had, a lot of, we had a lot of debate around this because um, there is $100,000 of money, um, new money, for them to spend. And what they've said is they've got four sectors that they wanted to allocate that to. So this was what wasn't totally clear in their submission was they were asking for extra. Um, so, so when we brought this proposal forward, um, our feeling was it was worthy of support because it's it's an excellent fit in all regards with, with district development if we felt we were still going to sit within 7.8%. Um, if we were looking to be heading above that, we possibly feel this is one we would not support initially um, if the feeling was we needed to stick at 7.8%. Um, so just, just wanted you to be aware in terms of staff guidance, it would be we do support it quite strongly but we felt at a certain point you're going to have to start drawing a line and make some prioritisation decisions. This might be one that we'd say, come back and talk to us after you've spent the 100. Um, and obviously, as we know, prior to starting this list, you've added a couple of things in. So I would suggest to you that um, it's, it's only cautious support from, from our perspective because of those reasons. So look, I think they've just got their feet under the table. They've got plenty of funding already and plenty of things to be carrying on with for the next year or so and I think this is something that could be pushed out to year two. I think there are more pressing issues at the moment. It's not something they've socialised with the wider community as well so they'll, in the meantime they'll have time to do that. I'm presuming it's around their feasibility study for um, education which is something that they could have conversations for less than $50,000 as an initial step before we decide to fund a full-blown study. Yeah, thank you, Janet. Just uh, raise the, the education feasibility study, so thanks. Oh, I just wanted to add that, um, I, the same as the, these people, um, it is a $50,000 for um, a feasibility study for the um, education hub, and they have been chatting to a whole lot of educators. Um, they are quite a bit down the track with it, um, which is heartening. So it could be potentially funded from somewhere else. I don't, I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. But um, yeah, it, it could it could sit on the fence for sure. Sorry, Miss Mayor. I just want to agree with Janet. Um, I, I think they do have a significant amount on their plate. And I noticed Councillor Compton did ask the question that I asked to be put to them, but there wasn't an answer about whether they talked to government about this particular pro proposal. I think there just wasn't enough information, despite me wanting to um, support it um, for a development. I appreciate the comments that they've sort of just really got their feet under the table, but as Councillor Buswell has said, they have actually got a lot of stuff underway. Um, I'm comfortable with the Chief Executive's response that if it is um, that important they can fund it out of their existing um, provisions that have been made through the um, LTP and potentially come back um, if there is a need to relook at things and see what our current position is. I'm reluctant just to tell them to push it out um, because it might make sense to us to push it out but it won't make sense to them to push it out um, and it's not so much of a funding thing it's a it's a, it's a timing thing um, and I'm also reluctant that we set them up um, to get going and then at their first request we just knock them back and um, and I also don't want to see them not succeed due to lack of support and funding so I'm comfortable with the approach that um, you know potentially we may not carry this through um, but I just want to caution elected members that if they get the study underway out of their existing funds and there's other stuff that comes up and they come back to the table with a good case, business case, um, or whether that's internally to the staff through existing budgets, then we at least need to consider that. Because the last thing we can do, and we've heard it from the other organisations that asked for them to be set up, is to set them up to fail without sufficient funding and support. So um, I'm not going against what everyone else has said, but I just want to make everyone aware of, the, I guess, some of those risks as well. 
Mekan. I may be a, bit, a little thick. <laughs> but um, do we have the funds and can we en enable the funds when the request comes later? Or do we have to make it? I mean, that, it's a sort of a catch-22 situation. Yeah, it is. We've been down these paths, haven't we? Trying to, trying to release money. Um, <laughs> so all I'm saying is we'll give it a good look if, say, halfway through the financial year they come forward with such a good idea um, that we want to consider how, how could we fund it and if so, how. And it would be by reprioritising something else. Now, as we know, um, as time goes by, there are things that come up that cost us more, that cost us less. So I make no uh, assurances whatsoever other than that. We'll give it a good look at the time. And so They do have 100000 this year, yeah. and it grows in year two. So, so what you're telling us is that there's no kaching on this one right now, but you might be able to find it later if need be. Yep, I'll ask you all to enter your pockets and we'll see where we get to um, in the middle of the year. I've got four dollars here. So. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is what we're saying. Probably no ka-ching right now is what it sounds like. If you could go back to them and, and ask them if they could possibly do a feasibility report that they're already working on for 25000 I mean, I just can't see how they're spending $50,000 on that when I see a lot of other feasibility report reports come across the table for under 30000 you know, and that's my question. Yeah. Um, but we can have those conversations. Um, I, I think we're either in or we're out um, at the moment. Um, you can spend $100,000 on, a, on a something flash or $5,000 and get what you paid for. So, so, so rather, than, rather than focus on the amount, I think if we go back and have the conversation based on the steer, which is it's a bit much for us right now, um, but if you want to get into it and then come back and talk to us through the year, we'll, we'll be receptive to it, the conversation at least. That's what I think I'm hearing, or at least suggesting and looking for a nod. So, Councillor mm -hmm. Bugwell, given that you'll be in the hot seat, yeah, I don't mind. are you are you happy to defend it? Yeah, that's okay. okay. So, no catching at the moment. Next. Oh, is is um, nearly six fifteen. Shall we break for dinner? Yeah, yes. I would suggest that. Um, and so, because this slide is actually the end of the ones that we are bringing to the table to include additional funding to, so it's but a good it's place still to... still within the 7.8? Yes. Without well, the 50,000? You've got a little bit more now because we've taken... Well, it's 120 for the landfill. Uh, for the oh, waste yes. Transition. So we'll... Uh, so yeah, probably in negative we'll territory. We'll do it. We'll... We'll do those two things. The landfill and... Well, not the landfill, the... Um, landfill yeah, so, so all in all... It, all in all, that's about 150,000, I guess, that you've added back in. It, it took it to 8.05 with all these things in and that. But we'll have that all updated. So when you get yeah. back after dinner, there'll be a new spreadsheet up there that shows yes. exactly where we're at now. There's no point, no point 0.2 for recycling, no point 0 0.07 for the swimming pool. Is that what you gain from extra revenue? Yeah. Okay, so Andrew's just texted me. We're at 7.92 after all the changes we've made right up until this moment. Thanks, Andrew. So I think we need to have coins with 0 0.07 each, and you can just keep moving them backwards and forwards. <laughs>